On October 30th, 1517, a German monk by the name of Martin Luther uh, famously uh, nailed a document to the door of the church in Wittenberg, Germany. Um, this document is referred to as the 95 Theses. Now, Martin Luther was also a professor at the university in Wittenberg, and what he wanted to do by posting up this theological document was prompt a debate in the university community over the need for reform in the church of the day. I think it's fair to say that um, Martin Luther got what he asked for and more uh, because this event is recognized as being the sort of key event that started a massive movement in the history of Christianity and the Christian church, which uh, we came to know as the Protestant Reformation. Now, about 160 years after the beginning of the Reformation, a Dutch theologian with a really cool name, his name was Jodocus van Lodenstein. Jodocus van Lodenstein um, made the following observation on the nature of the church. Von Lodenstein said, the church is reformed and always being reformed according to the word of God. God is constantly reforming his church and he's doing it through his word. And one of the ways in which we know his word is through this book. Now, last week, um, Todd began this preaching series on how we're being reformed according to the Word of God by talking about how the church is shaped and reformed by our reading of the first five books of the Bible, the uh, group of uh, books that we call the Pentateuch, or uh, the Hebrews call the Torah, the books of the law. My task today is to talk a little bit to you about how the church is shaped and reformed by our reading of the Psalms. It's Thanksgiving, and um, I'm pretty thankful to have the opportunity to preach to you, not just because I enjoy uh, preaching, um, I enjoy the privilege of preaching, but I particularly love preaching from the Psalms. Now, the book of Psalms is a collection of about 100, well, exactly 150 um, sh relatively short writings. They're by different authors, um, although a large number of them are written by King David, and most of them were written under his patronage as king. They're poetic writings, um, and they're primarily designed for use, as we've been using them today, in worship together, in corporate worship. They're very musical. Um, it has often been said uh, with a great deal of accuracy that the book of Psalms is a hymnary, not unlike the, the red hymnary that you see in the back of the pew in front of you, a collection of songs and poems that the church uses, that God's people use together to worship. But the Psalms also are very famous for being, in the way that they're written, very personal, very emotional, very raw in some ways, very real in the human feelings and experiences that they express and that they deal with. And although the Psalms cover a very broad range of emotions, I think it's fair to say that in the Psalms, we get to see a lot of human weakness and vulnerability and doubt and dependency. These weaknesses in humanity tend to show up a lot in the Psalms. The question is, though, how useful um, are the Psalms for carrying out that role that um, Van Lodenstein has uh, ascribed to them, which is, um, how does God use the Psalms to reform us, to reform His church? I think the answer is that He uses the Psalms very effectively uh, to reform us. And I'll tell you why I think so. I think that the way in which God reforms us through His Word is that He uses His Word to reveal Himself to us. The Word of God is, word, is God's activity in choosing to reveal to us 
to our hearts and to our minds who it is that He is and therefore who it is that we are in relationship with Him. Well, the ultimate form of this revelation of God to us comes in the form of Jesus Christ Himself. And as Todd pointed out last week, when in Scripture we use the phrase, the Word of God, we're referring not just to the written Scriptures, but we're referring to Christ Himself as the Word of God and to the power of God's Holy Spirit moving in us. But the case of Jesus Himself, His incarnation as the Word of God, is very instructive in this respect because what we see in the incarnation, what we see in Jesus, um, God becoming human, is God choosing to reveal Himself to us through the weakness of humanity. So just as in Christ, the Word of God, God reveals Himself to us through the prism of the weakness of humanity, so also in the Psalms, I think. God uniquely reveals Himself through us to, through the prism of human weakness. Now, the psalm that we're looking at today that was read so beautifully um, by Lucky a little earlier on is Psalm 34. Um, you may have noticed that in your bulletin, there's actually an insert that has the full text of Psalm 34. I want to dig a little bit into the way in which it's structured and some of the words that are used, so you may find it helpful to look at that insert or to crack open your Bible and take a look um, at Psalm 34. But there are a few features that I want to point out. One of the extraordinary things about the Psalms is the way they're constructed contains almost as much of the message as the specific things that they say. Now, Psalm 34 is actually divided, as you can see, into four distinct sections. In verses 1 to 3, it opens with this call to praise God. It's a very uh, forceful, very clear uh, call by the psalmist inviting people to join him in praising God. Then it moves into the second section from verses 5 to 10, and the theme of these verses is a description using poetic language of God's faithfulness to us. Then there's a break. In the third section of the psalm, from verses 11 to 14, there's this little section of what we have to call ethical instruction, admonition and encouragement to us in terms of how we should be behaving. And then the psalmist returns in the final uh, seven verses or so, seven or eight verses, to describing God's faithfulness. So although the general theme that runs through the psalm is one of describing God's faithfulness to us, there is this very little interesting part in the middle, and I want to talk about that a little bit more in a few minutes. The other thing I draw your attention to is that in terms of poetic language, there is a particular theme that runs throughout this psalm, and you see it in uh, three key places. And it has to do, interestingly enough, with the way in which we use our mouths. Verse 1 of this psalm says, His praise will be always on my lips. So in this first verse, the psalmist is describing using his mouth to praise God. Then you scroll down to verse 8. And in verse 8, the psalmist says, Taste and see that the Lord is good. And then this theme returns farther down in verse 13, where the psalmist says, keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking lies. That's an important uh, literary detail to note in terms of unpacking what it is that the psalm has to say to us. And we'll return to that in a moment or two. But first I want to explore this um, primary theme that comes out through most of the verses, which is God's faithfulness. Now, it's thanksgiving. 
And we have, as Paula alluded to, and as the psalm that we read for our call to worship has alluded to, we have much to be thankful for. I've always thought that you could um, have a Thanksgiving morning uh, worship service where you virtually did nothing other than inviting people in the congregation to stand up and list the ways in which they're thankful to God and the things that they're thankful for. Now, Thanksgiving is a harvest celebration. Uh, And because of that, we tend, more so than anything else, to focus on our material blessings, on the bounty of provision for us, on the beauty of creation, uh, these kinds of blessings. But what's really interesting about Psalm 34 is Psalm 34, although it's a psalm of thanksgiving, it doesn't give thanks for those things. If you take a look at it verse by verse, you'll see that what the psalmist in Psalm 34 is giving thanks for is to God's faithfulness to His people through the bad experiences of life, through the seasons of trouble and difficulty and doubt and despair. There are references in this psalm to God's faithfulness to the poor, to the afflicted, to the brokenhearted, to those who are feeling crushed in their spirit. The verbs that are listed through this psalm talk about deliverance from fear, about being saved from our troubles, about providing provision of refuge to people who need refuge. The other thing that's interesting to note if you read this psalm carefully is who is it that God has been and is faithful to? It's not a broad description of God's faithfulness to everyone, although God um, sends blessing, I think, to all of us. But rather, verse 15 provides the key when it says, the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous. It's the righteous who God is faithful to. Now, for any of you in the room who may be righteous, uh, I don't want you leaping to the conclusion that you're on easy street, because in the context of Scripture, the term righteousness doesn't mean those who, because they live by a very high moral standard and always live up to all of the moral rules and, uh, and codes of behavior, have earned God's favor and blessing. That's not what the psalmist is talking about when he talks about the righteous. By righteousness, he means those who are right in their relationship with God. And as you can see, God's provision is for those who seek it from Him. In verses 4 and then in verse 10, it refers to the righteous as those who seek the Lord. In verse 5, it refers to the righteous as those who look to the Lord. In 6, it's those who call on the Lord. In verse 7, and then later in verse 9, it's those who fear the Lord. In verse 8, it says, the righteous are those who take refuge in the Lord. And if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you've probably had firsthand personal experience of God's faithfulness in troubled circumstances. I think if each of us took a moment to reflect, many of us would be able to point to times when it wasn't a good season, when times were troubled, when there was difficulty, and where God was there and was faithful. And so, at Thanksgiving, that's one of the things that we're thankful for, God's faithfulness to us. But the question that this psalm asks is, is gratitude enough? I read a quote the other day from uh, the well-known Christian pastor, preacher, and author, Tim Keller. Uh, And I think this quote from Keller um, sums up a little bit of what the psalmist has to say to us in this psalm. Keller said, it's one thing to be grateful. It's another to give thanks. Gratitude is what you feel. Thanksgiving is what you do. And I think in Psalm 34, the psalmist offers us three admonitions about what to do with our gratitude. And 
echoing back to that theme that I brought to your attention earlier, all three of the things that the psalmist invites us to do with our gratitude have to do with using our mouths. Again, let's take a look at that, um, at verse 1, at that introductory section. This is verses 1 to 3, and it says, I will extol the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. I will glory in the Lord. Let the afflicted hear and rejoice. Glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. From the very outset, the psalmist is saying, don't just think about your gratitude. Don't just experience it as a feeling, but express it. Give credit where credit is due. In song and in prayer, and perhaps most of all in our conversations with one another, with other people, we should be giving credit to God for His provision in our lives, for His protection in our lives, for the ways in which He's been faithful to us. The second uh, admonition that the, the writer of this psalm offers us is found in verse 8, where it says, Taste and see that the Lord is good. I have to say, um, I... I got to choose which psalm I was going to be preaching on today, um, and I'm quite pleased with myself um, that I've arranged to preach the psalm that contains the famous verse, taste and see that the Lord is good at Thanksgiving. Um, Because many of us over the next day or so will be gathered with friends or family or both um, to celebrate some kind of a very special meal Uh, that reflects the bounty of the harvest, the the provision in our lives. And so all of us are going to have a chance, um, or at least many, many of us are going to have a chance over the next day and a half, a particularly acute opportunity to taste and see that the Lord is good, particularly if you're fond, as I am, of turkey. And many of us, over the course of um, this weekend, We'll take time before we eat to pause and give voiced expression to our thanks. Even among families who don't have a regular, consistent, running practice of saying grace before meals all the time, and the Robertson family, I think, are guilty of sometimes saying grace and sometimes not, most of us get around to saying grace at least before the Thanksgiving meal because it seems kind of appropriate to give thanks at Thanksgiving. So that's good. But it's important to understand that when the psalmist says, taste and see that the Lord is good, he's speaking metaphorically, right? What he's saying is, in the midst of describing God's faithfulness is taste and see, embrace this experience of God. And how does he call on us to do that? Well, you look back at the verbs that he uses in the sermon. How do we taste God's faithfulness? We do it by seeking Him, by looking to Him, by fearing Him, which in Scripture means to offer Him our reverence and our obedience and our love. We taste God by calling on His name when we are in distress. We taste God by seeking refuge in Him when we do feel as if we're under attack by the circumstances of life. And the psalmist says, if you do these things, if you turn to God, if you seek Him, if you call on Him, if you revere and obey and love Him and trust Him, you will see that He is good. You will experience His faithfulness. So we have two recommendations for how to live out our gratitude, to speak out our thanksgiving and to lean even more deeply into our trust in God. And finally... Uh, the third one. Now, um, today I'm preaching to you on how God uses the Psalms to reform the church. Um, And the Psalms in this case uh, are kind of a representative of a whole group of books in the Bible, uh, in the Old Testament, that are known as the writings. Generally, the books of the Old Testament fall into three categories. You have 
the three books of the law, the Torah, the Pentateuch, you have the prophets, and then the others are kind of generally put together into a category called the writings. Well, another book of the Bible uh, that's quite well known from this category, in fact, it's the book that appears right after Psalms in the Bible, is the book of Proverbs. And it's interesting, um, just as the D book of Psalms is associated with David, the book of Proverbs is associated with David's son and Aaron's successor as king of Israel, his son Solomon. So you have these two great books uh, in the Old Testament, and one is largely written by the father and one is largely written by the son. And the, the writings themselves tend to match the personalities. I think the picture that we get of David is of a person who is all about passion, whereas Solomon is all about wisdom. David is all about describing how we live our lives, and Solomon is all about prescribing how we should live our lives. Generally, if you want verses that offer you direct tips, suggestions, instruction about how to live your life, you'd look to the book of Proverbs. In that sense, Proverbs is a great book for reforming the church. But this psalm has this little hidden treasure in it, this little middle section that I alluded to earlier. It happens halfway through. It kind of interrupts the flow of the psalmist's discussion of God's faithfulness. And this is what it says. It says, Whoever of you loves life and desires to see many good days... Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from telling lies. Turn from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. The psalmist says, look, God is always faithful to us. Are you thankful for God's faithfulness? Do you want to have a life that is based on trusting God and a life that is characterized by the experience of God's faithfulness, if you want that sort of life, the psalmist says, then what you should do is start fearing and revering and obeying and loving God in everything that you do. Turn from evil, the psalmist says, and do good. And he says this especially in the context of the things that we say to other people. In this third instance, the psalmist once again brings us back to what it is that we're doing with our mouths. He says, keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking lies. Now these words in the middle of Psalm 34, you can hear echoed much later in Scripture in that passage that Sue read for us from the book of James. James wrote at length on this subject. In chapter 2, verse 17, James says, faith by itself, if not accompanied by action, is dead. You could hear James saying, gratitude to God, thankfulness to God for His faithfulness, thanksgiving, is dead if it isn't causing you to behave in a particular way as a result. In chapter 3, verses 9 to 10, he writes at length about what a dangerous thing our mouths are. He says, with the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with that same mouth we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, James says, this should not be. And I think the psalmist wrote about it and James wrote about it because it's a bit of a chronic ongoing problem um, with us, weak, vulnerable humans, um, that we let both praise for God and curse and evil t speech towards others um, come out. Before I conclude, which I'm going to in a minute or two, 
although my children know that I generally say the word to conclude about 20 minutes before the end of the sermon. Before I conclude, I want to take a minute um, to talk to you a little bit about my own experience with this. Now, one of the almost immutable principles of good preaching is don't use yourself as an example, but I'm going to, I'm going to break that rule today. And I'm going to because the message of Psalm 34 cuts really close to the bone um, for me. I am a Christian who struggles with taming his tongue. Here's the thing. We're told that the church is being reformed according to the the Word of God. But it isn't just the dead letters on the page that reform us. It's clear from Scripture It's clear from von Lodenstein, who wrote that uh, theological idea himself. It's that what we're talking about when we say that we're reformed by the Word of God is that we're talking about the power of God's Holy Spirit inside of us to change us, to transform us into Christ's image. When Scripture is read, whether it's here in corporate worship or it's in private devotions, it's the Holy Spirit that takes that Scripture and works it in us to change us for the better. This is accomplished through the indwelling presence and power of the Spirit. And the Apostle Paul, in the book of Galatians, talks in a fairly famous passage about the fruits of the Spirit. Paul says that the presence of the Holy Spirit in us manifests itself with certain kinds of behaviors and personality characteristics that naturally flow out of being reformed into the shape of God. And many of you will be familiar with this list. The nine fruits of the Spirit are love, joy, and peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Now, I, am, I have sometimes joked a little bit darkly, and some of you, I think, in conversations have heard me say this. I've said for a number of years that I think family gatherings, you know, at holidays or for special occasions like Christmas or Thanksgiving, um, are wonderful spiritual exercises and because when you gather with your family together in one place, you generally have to use all nine of the fruits of the Spirit in order to survive. I've always thought that that was kind of a funny and clever thing to say. But you know, when it comes to family gatherings, and particularly to times that I spend with my in-laws, I like to imagine that when I'm in those gatherings, I have to exercise a lot of patience and self-control. But I'm being reformed by the Word of God And I can tell you that over time, more and more, what the Holy Spirit has been saying to me is, Brian, it's very nice that you think that you use a lot of patience and self-control when you're at family gatherings. My hope for you is that I can teach you to use more love and gentleness and kindness in the way you talk to the people that you love. You see, I, as an example, am being reformed by the Word of God. I'm becoming more like Christ. I'm not very close yet, but it's an ongoing process. Not every um, text that a preacher preaches on uh, automatically provides what, in preaching terms, we call the application. You know, the part at the end of the sermon where we say, okay, this is very nice, but, you know, what do you, the congregation, now do with this? What's something you can take with you and go and do this week? I love Psalm 34 because it comes with this brilliant built-in application. It's a real gift to preachers, right? Because the psalmist provides us three really practical ways for us to live out our thankfulness to God for His faithfulness to us. And if you preach it at Thanksgiving, people not only have the application, but they have this brilliant opportunity to do the application if they're, in fact, going to be going to a family gathering or a gathering with friends 
sometime later in the day or the next day, as we are now. Thanksgiving is a great opportunity to practice these three admonitions. Most of us will attend some sort of meal with family and friends. When you do, I'd encourage you to do three things, just as the psalmist has encouraged us. Number one, take time to give tongue to your thanksgiving and praise. Take time to tell each other how God has blessed you. Secondly, as the taste of God's bounty fills your mouth, be reminded that you've been invited to taste God's faithfulness itself. Reflect on how to lean more deeply into God's faithfulness. Accept the invitation to taste and see that the Lord is good. And finally, be deliberate and careful about making sure that no matter who you are talking to or what you're talking about, no words come out of your mouth that are unworthy to come out of the same mouth that you use to praise God. Amen.